Good morning. Welcome to Sabbath Devotional. This is Steve from Southern Illinois. And um, as you can see, the trees have largely lost their leaves. The honeysuckle is the only thing that's still green. And Southern Illinois has descended into the season of cold mud. Be thankful, those of you who get white stuff, uh, because cold mud is not very romantic. So today, uh, I want to tell you a story from uh, my ad adolescence. I was 15, um, and I was in the basement of one of the faculty homes on campus at the boarding academy my brother and I were attending. And I and another student were soldering the copper pipes in place to, for a new bathroom installation. I had uh, worked along with the maintenance supervisor on several projects and this was my first solo installation. And uh, it was a big responsibility. <clears throat> but we were um, soldering the pipe in place but when you do that you have to the pipes have to be just precisely positioned because if they're under tension the solder doesn't spread well and then you get a leak and that never works well <clears throat> but we had troubles getting the pipes in just the right place and and um, one of us I cannot remember clearly which of us uh, one of us had the bright idea of using a pipe wrench and um, wedging it between the copper pipe and the uh, floor joist above us uh, to hold the pipe in place and things worked really well until the pipe heated up and the joint moved and the pipe moved and the wrench slipped. It wouldn't have been a problem except that directly underneath the wrench as it fell was the toilet bowl that we were trying to connect. And as the wrench fell, both he and I gasped and made a desperate attempt to grab the wrench only to hear the crash and the sound of breaking porcelain as the wrench hit the toilet bowl and broke this brand new toilet bowl into smithereens. Now you have to understand the context of this story. Um, this was a small parochial boarding school, um, struggling financially. And um, this project that we were working on had been paid for privately by the faculty member and we were only supposed to be providing the labor. So this was not even the school's toilet bowl. It was his toilet bowl. And I had just broken his toilet bowl. Things were are a blur from there, okay? Uh, I decided that I had to replace the toilet bowl to avoid punishment. Um, and uh, but I had no idea of how much it would cost. I got paid student wages for the work that I did. Would there be enough in my wages from now until the end of the school year to cover the cost? So with that question burning in my mind, I went to a friend and borrowed a bicycle. And when they said, where are you going? I said, um, don't ask me. I don't want to get you in trouble. At which point <laughs> they looked at me. I said, trust me, I will be back before sundown vespers. This was a Friday evening and, and all the students had together for sundown vesper, vespers as the sun was going down for a, a uh, worship service. So off I went on the bicycle. I knew that the hardware store was on the other side of town on the road leading out of town. I had that vague, vague direction. This was a town the size of Fairfield, about 5,000, so not a big town. 
it shouldn't have been hard for me to find my way through town, except that I was, I was afraid of getting caught by some of the faculty members that might be out and about, so I wanted to stay away from the main road, so I was taking the back roads, and I kept ending up on roads that were going in the wrong direction, and it took me an hour and a half to find my way through town, get to the other side, finally locate the road going out of town that I needed. And I'm riding my bicycle along this road, which was a, a, an old a high, Iowa highway. And if you didn't grow up in Iowa in the 60s and 70s, I don't know if you know what that means. Uh, Iowa highways were very narrow. They were designed for probably wagons. And uh, two cars could barely fit on them. They had no shoulders. There was this little concrete ditch along each edge. Riding a bicycle on an Iowa highway was a hazardous adventure. And uh, to make matters worse, there was a cold wind blowing in my face. This was fall and kind of like today, gray and uh, verge of winter. There was a cold wind blowing directly into my face and by now the sun was starting to go down and I had that low hanging sun shining in my eyes, almost blinding me. I'm riding along this highway that's narrow. People are getting off of work. The traffic is, is picking up. Cars are going past me honking. Some of them wait and try to avoid me. Others just zip past just inches from my elbow. I am getting more and more tense. And through all of this, I have this sinking feeling in the pit of my stomach. I'm not going to be able to clean up my mess. And then suddenly the traffic from behind me stopped. I could still hear horns honking back there, but nobody was zipping past me anymore. I was going up a small hill, and as I was going up, I glanced over my shoulder, and there right behind me, only about six feet behind me, was a pickup that had slowed down, not just slowed down, it had pulled out so that the cars behind it couldn't pass or couldn't see to pass, and it was shielding me from the traffic. I immediately stood up on my pedals and, and tried to get over the hill as quickly as possible because I really appreciated what he was doing for me. And as we got over the brow of the hill, the pickup edged past me and then pulled off on a place where it could get partially off of the, the, the highway. As a consequence, it blocked my path and I had to stop. And I was starting to, to get feel frustrated. Why did this person shield me from the traffic and now is stopping me? And then the door opened and out, out stepped Mr. McDaniel, the maintenance supervisor for the academy. And my stomach just went whomp, busted. Okay. There was no way out of this now because you see there was this school regulation students were not allowed to keep cam to leave campus uh, and I had no one knowingly broken that regulation trying to clean up my mess you understand but I knew I had broken the rules. Mr. McDaniel got out of the pickup walked back to me and said let's put the bike in the back. That was it didn't greet me, didn't reprimand me, didn't ask what I was doing. He just said, let's put the bike in the back. So we put the bike in the back and I climbed in the cab with him and he looked at me and he said, I understand you're going to the hardware store. <laughs> Somebody had been burying tails out of me back on campus. <clears throat> I nodded my head and he said, okay. So he drove me to the, the hardware store and I went in and uh, he went in with me and I looked at him and he said, go ahead. So I, I found one of the uh, clerks and I uh, asked the price of a toilet bowl 
and the clerk's looking at me like I'm an absolute fool. Uh, Mr. McDaniel is standing in the background. And um, I discovered that the toilet bowl would be far in excess of what I could earn during this school year. In fact, it was in excess of what I could earn in the rest of this school year and the coming school year before I would graduate. I didn't know what to do at this point. And the clerk said, so do you want it or not? And I started to mumble something about I'll have to come back when Mr. McDaniel stepped up and said, put it on the Academy account. And I looked at him startled. I knew that the Academy had not paid for the original toilet bowl. And I felt, felt even more horrible. Mr. McDaniel had me carry the toilet bowl and put it in the back of the pickup, and then we drove back to campus. He didn't say a word to me. He drove directly to the house from which I had borrowed the, the, the bicycle. I unloaded the bike and put it away, and then he drove me to Vespers, never saying a word. And I am feeling horrible. I have broken the toilet bowl. I have broken the rules. I have borrowed a bicycle. The person who borrowed the bicycle allowed me to go off campus and break the rules. They're probably in trouble. I have been busted. The school is having to pay for the damages. I am so, so in trouble. The next week, the faculty held a disciplinary hearing. I was not invited. So I only have third and fourth hand uh, accounts of what happened. The owner of the house who had paid the, uh, for the toilet bowl was adamant, adamant that I, uh, I pay for it, pay the damages. And when he found out that even, even with 100% uh, of my earnings over the next year and a half, I could not uh, earn that much, he, he was calling for my dismissal and expulsion from the school. Mr. McDaniel was a quiet man. The lack of words on our ride back from the hardware store was nothing unusual. And in the past year and a half, he had said probably two sentences in faculty meetings. But all of a sudden, they couldn't shut him up. He was defending me against every accusation, every, um, every assertion that I needed to be expelled. Despite the fact that he acknowledged that I had intentionally broken the rules. The discussion did not come to an end until Mr. McDaniel pulled out his wallet and paid personally for the cost of the toilet bowl. When the principal called me into his office after the meeting to give me the verdict, he said, Steve, you owe Mr. McDaniel a debt of gratitude I don't know how you're ever going to repay. And I never did. But Mr. McDaniel always walked on water for me from that point on. I was uh, visiting a Unitarian church with a friend. And in their Sunday school, they uh, got on to a discussion of grace. And one of the members said, I don't get grace. It's so irrational. I mean, if a judge just arbitrarily said, you know what, you look, you look sorry. So I know that you murdered all these people. I know that you're a criminal. I know that you're a repeat offender. But you know what, I'm going to... I'm going to forgive you and I'm going to go to prison in your place. It's irrational. It just makes no sense. 
A lot of us who are spiritual but not religious feel the same way about the topic of God's grace. Buddhists have a concept of grace. Um, the, Christianity is not the only religion that talks about grace. There is a large group of sects in Buddhism called the Pure Land Buddhists, where one of the, the Buddhas uh, commits to saving everyone who's ever lived by extending his excess merit to their lives giving his merit for them but he has an un, untappable quantity of merit so it doesn't it's no sacrifice on his part for me grace is mr. McDaniel grace is him shielding me from the traffic that was threatening me grace was him defending me against those who accused me. Grace was him paying the cost of cleaning up my mess out of his own pocket. Grace was him never accusing me or condemning me or reprimanding me. The compassion, the generosity, the magnanimous spirit that he exhibited was grace. And that's what I want to share with you today. For me, grace is real. God's grace is real because I saw it in the life of a man. Here in Southern Illinois, we're having hard times. Um, St. Louis hospitals have been completely full for several days this last week. S Evansville is the same way. One of the health systems that I'm affiliated with, nine out of the 14 doctors, PAs, and nurse practitioners are out of commission with COVID. Yet when I went to Walmart yesterday, more than half of the people were not wearing masks or making any attempt at social distancing and were deriding those who were. Now, I could rant about the political and community leaders, the church leaders who have leveraged this crisis for political or social gain, but it wouldn't change a thing. Friends, this crisis is real. People are dying. Healthcare workers are hospitalized and on the verge of of death. My friends have been thrown under the bus. Please don't be that guy who throws them under the bus. Grace is the way you live your life for others. The way I live my life. And we either make it believable or unbelievable by that life. Be safe, my friends. Be prudent. But above all, keep looking up. I'll see you next week.